Uh, he's going to enlighten you on the use of photos, the unsung heroes of UX design. Please give a big round of applause for James Chudley. Thank you very much. Well, hello, everyone. Hello, UXers of the North. I am a UXer of the South. Nice to meet you all. Um, actually, before I go any further, um, I'm involved with uh, organising an event down in Bristol, which I'm not trying to promote, but I, I kind of appreciate what goes, goes into organising these kind of events. So um, I thought it would be nice if everyone just gave the organisers a massive round of applause for uh, organising such a fantastic event. Okay, so... Um, I am of the South, and I apologise for that, but I have done my time in the North, which you'll be, you'll be glad to know. Um, I spent a good couple of years working in Liverpool for a maze, and I bumped into a couple of my old colleagues here today, which has been fantastic. But um, what's nice about being back in the, the North West is that this is where I kind of um, found my UX feet, and also I, um, I kind of discovered my passion for uh, photography as well, so uh, a very kind of significant time to be back. Um, I was living in Liverpool, and I hear you guys don't get on so well with the Liverpudlians. I don't know if that's still a thing. It was a bit of a problem about eight, ten years ago, so I hope you're getting on a bit better than you were. But anyway, that's my background. So these are the, these are the things I wanted to cover today. Um, there's a, there's a, few, a few short things. It's only a short talk, and I can't get through as much as I'd like. But if I can concentrate on these things, I want to convey the fact of why I believe photos are so important. I want to share some stories with you from my own kind of design and research projects. Um, I want to kind of pull out some of the, the qualities that I feel that makes a photo usable. And I appreciate the concept of a, f of a photograph being usable is a strange, is a strange concept, but hopefully that will become clearer. Um, but I guess fundamentally what I want to do is, as a practitioner, I want to give you some practical tips that you could use in the office tomorrow in your own work uh, to try and improve the quality of uh, web photos. Um, as has been uh, mentioned, I, I work as a UX director, so basically that means I run large-scale research and design projects for a company called CX Partners down in Bristol. Um, we work, well, I we guess we're lucky to work with the great and the good, uh, working on a, a wide range of projects, but I guess what's important is pretty much in every project I work on, I see issues that arise from photography, uh, but yet I see very, very little time spent thinking about photos during the design process, which I'm sure will be familiar with you guys. Um, as has also been mentioned, I've written a couple of books. Um, I was digging out some pictures of the books the other day for the purposes of the presentation. And, um, you know, it's good to see the books have got some good reviews. You know, it's always heartening to see. This is my favourite review. Um, if you're looking for a book that's a good price, it's well packaged, that arrives on time and was just what she wanted, then I can wholeheartedly recommend our book. What, a, what, a, what an amazing endearment. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to talk too much about this one, although um, I did manage to shoehorn a, a chapter about photography into that book, which um, I wrote with my colleague Jasmine a couple of years ago. And that was really the precursor to the Web Photos book, um, which is a short little book. The idea for those was they're like a, a book in an app format, so two quid, it's 8,000 words, I think it was in the end, so a very kind of quick read. That was the idea behind those. And a lot of the things I'll talk about today are straight from that book. Um, I guess all those things aside, first and foremost, I absolutely love photography. It's been my passion for about 12 to 15 years. Um, when I first, I used to work for Amaze in Liverpool. And when I first joined there, I'd previously worked at Leeds University. I was kind of a scientist, researcher, that sort of type. Um, I was given a job as an information architect. Had no idea what information architecture was. Thankfully, I read your book, sir, and that, that helped. Thank you for that. That was amazing. <laughs> Not often you get a chance to do that. Um, so that, that was good, that helped. Um, but I was, I was dropped into an amazing group of people, uh, some of which are here, uh, which again is fantastic, um, and a very, very creative environment. And I remember thinking, God, you know, I'm not creative. How on earth am I going to blag this? This is a nightmare. Um, and then uh, sat next to a chap called Simon Vaughan, who I was hoping I'd, I'd see, but it's not here, sadly, um, who was really into his photography. And um, I just thought, that's amazing. That looks like an interesting thing to can do. I can't draw, I can't paint, I can't do any of these things that all these guys are doing. Maybe I could have a crack at that. So I went and got myself a camera and started playing with it and, and realized that actually it combined so many of my hobbies. I, I like getting out and about. Uh, and so I discovered landscape photography and that was something that really resonated with, with me. Um, I, I enjoyed the artistic side. However, I didn't think I had any kind of talent and still question that to this day. But um, that was something that was an interesting journey to, to, to start. And also, I guess, the scientific side of things, the things I learned at school about, um, about light and refraction, and all those kind of things kind of played into it. So it's this kind of wonderful combination of things. And it really resonated with me. Um, and ever since, I've been trying to shoehorn it into my day job. And look, here we are. So there you go. Um, 
I guess fundamentally, I'm, I've embarked on a bit of a mission, um, and that's to try and improve the effectiveness and the quality of photography that we, we work on, so the, the quality of uh, photography on the web. This is an amazing photo that I found this weekend. There's a great website called Getty Critics, and essentially, they've just found lots and lots of stock photography, and it's a, it's a bit of a joke, I guess, and, and pulled together things that you can never imagine being seen in real life. But I, I've seen pictures sort of like this. this. This is a little bit special, but sort of like this within the products that I've tested and researched with people and, and, and works on. And so, and I'm sure you guys have been in the same situation. You've been sat with, um, with users within your research and they, they, encounter, they encounter imagery like this. And um, I've seen so much negative reaction to this type of thing. You know, who are these people? You know, the perfect family, the son, the daughter. What's she doing with a rake? It's going to take her forever. It's a nightmare. <laughs> it's, it absolutely bamboozles you and throws you and just, you can't go beyond that. You know, no matter what the proposition is, the quality of the product, all of these rules and principles and guidelines, that will just stop people in their tracks and, and it, is, it has a huge bearing. So I'm on a, bit, on a bit of a mission to try and change this and I hope you all kind of join me on my quest and that's really why I'm here and that's, that's what it's all about. These photos are funny, they're fantastic, but maybe don't deserve a place in the products we design. But of course, we're all photographers. Who's got a camera on them now? Well, that's everyone. And it's amazing, because you know, when I've, I've talked about this in the past, that hasn't been the case, but we're all photographers, and we spend, I'm sure, a lot of our time taking photo and video. So um, you're all creating these things, and lots and lots of people are creating lots and lots of photos the whole time. And just think about how many Photos you probably encounter in a standard web visit. I mean, I'm sure it's, it's, you see a huge amount on a daily basis. So they're having a huge impact on you and the way you use things. And of course, you're already experts in photo UX. You've all thought very hard about what profile picture you should put on your LinkedIn, on your Twitter, on your Facebook, um, because those things are doing different jobs. And I've just picked these. I really hope none of these people are here. That would be really awkward. Um, I've just picked these random examples just to, see the kind of, just to show the kind of strategies that people employ. And clearly, people are thinking about the impact they want to have when other people see these. So imagine you get the classic LinkedIn email. Do you want to link in with these people? Look, he knows Paul Smith. Are you linking with him? Brilliant. What about that one there? You know, straight away, oh, the laser doesn't work. Straight away, if you can't see a face, how do you feel about that person? Do you, would you, you know, hands up who would link in with that person? Never, imagine you've never met them. Random link in. Anyone link in? No, straight away, you, you don't. You don't, absolutely not. The middle one's probably a more classic kind of pose, just to kind of say, you know, I'm an educated person, whatever that might be. I don't know what's going on in that one. And actually, that's one I had. And it was like a classic kind of professional approach, that sort of thing. That was an interesting one. And then, I guess, another example on the right there, probably from a webcam, something like that. But straight away, you can't help but make a, uh, an impression of these types of people or, or consider whether or not that's an appropriate thing for the job it's trying to do. And it's interesting to think about the role that photography plays in our everyday life. I mean, we've, we've got these kind of iconic imagery of things that take us back to an event in time, and that's kind of almost imprinted on our brain. And photos are used within advertising campaigns to, to create a reaction. I mean, it's not, it's not a new thing, and we know this. We use photos to document the, the significant periods in our life. This is my friend Lisa doing some kind of Russian dance on a wedding night. It's an incredible, incredible occasion. It's great to see it. It makes me smile. It makes me happy. It reminds me of being there um, at the wedding. We capture our family memories, and you know, we, we share the images of our, of our favorite teams, and, and of course, take pictures of our children. So it's such a big part of our lives. It seems strange that we don't think about it or pay more attention to it during the design process. We also... <laughs> We also take pictures of the things that make us laugh. And, you know, we all see these daily, I'm sure, in our, on our Twitter streams and our Facebook streams of, of the things that people see. And imagine my delight when I was walking to the bus stop one morning in Bristol. And I walked down, down the road near where I live, and someone had made this amazing sign. It wasn't just a normal sign. It was a real metal sign, and it must have been someone from the council, and it was absolute genius. And this is by far and away the most popular photo I've ever taken. Like on Flickr, when I obsessively go out and take these lovely landscapes, well, I thought they were great landscape photos. This got more views, shares, whatever, you know, that, that sort of says something, I think. But, you know, it makes me smile. The irony, of course, is that photography has a huge impact on, on us as, as, as people. Uh, but I'd say it's given such tiny, tiny investment during the design process. And I've always found that strange. 
Um, but I've always seen it. I've always noticed it. And I don't know whether it's because I'm interested in photography and I keep an eye out for these sorts of things. But um, it's always been the way. And it, it's a real problem. So given the power of photography, that I'm sure we all understand, why do we do this? I mean, I, I'm sure you've seen this on your projects. You know, the classic situation. We've got no budget for photos. It's not my job. It's not my responsibility. Oh, that happens later. Oh, that's the content phase. You know, that bit that happens when you've done everything else. It's ridiculous. But I haven't seen anything quite like this in real life, but I've seen some things fairly close. And when have you, has anyone ever seen these scenes going on in their everyday working lives? <laughs> It's like the Business Olympics. This man's amazing. What's he doing with his arms? It's, it's incredible. But they're very, very prevalent. And um, of course, they're, they're cheap and easily accessible. And of course, with the proliferation of digital photography, it's become even easier to take and share these, these types of imagery. So the price has gone down, which has made them more, I guess, easy to get hold of. This is, I don't know if it's my favorite. I really like the leaves one now. I thought it was a good autumnal one. Up until that point, I quite like this one. It's like a young Sarah Beanie. She's had her identity stolen and she doesn't care. Doesn't give a shit. <laughs> She's just sitting there reading. Reading, I noticed on the train on the way up, an empty, an empty pamphlet. She doesn't care. It's amazing. And this is on a site that's trying to sell you um, identity theft protection. Of course, the angle they've gone for is relax. Just relax. What's the worst that can happen? You know, can just spend all your money, you know, gather, take on your ID. So it's a question of appropriateness, really. Um, but, you know, this happens all the time. One thing that really resonated with me was that when I'd go out and take pictures and I'd do kind of landscape photography, so I'd, I'd be kind of planning things and thinking of the right time of day and the right location, the right kit to use, and all these things I was thinking of. It kind of dawned on me that I was designing the photo. I was putting a lot of conscious effort into, into thinking about the outcome I was going to get. So I think it's important to think about the design that goes into a, a photo as well, and it's absolutely the case. So here's a picture from the IKEA site. And I wanted to kind of unpick the design thinking that's gone into this image and the construction of this image to contrive a, a scenario for the intent and purposes to flog some garden wear, essentially. Um, from the photographer's point of view, these are the kind of things that they'll have been talking about. You know, they've used a wide angle lens to co convey this sense of space. They're selling a lifestyle. It's this kind of, you live in the city, you've got this amazing um, kind of roof terrace, you've got this space. They've, um, they've used a, sh a shutter speed to convey uh, movement and dynamism within the image. They've deliberately chosen a certain location. There's, there's been a lot of thinking that's gone into this image. From a business point of view, and bear in mind that we're used, we're used to thinking about things from a business perspective, a user perspective. Think about it like this. It's the same. It's exactly the same. From a business point of view, they're trying to sell a product. So these are the sorts of things they may have briefed the photographer with to try and get that image. So show context, show cross-sell, show quality, demonstrate the features of things, sell the lifestyle. All of these things are kind of implicit within their image, but um, would have been absolutely at the forefront of that briefing when the person from the business has briefed that photographer to get them to do that piece of work. From the user's point of view or the customer's point of view, they're thinking about the image from their own perspective as well. So, you know, can you imagine owning it? How big is it? Will it fit in my house? Is it the right size? Does it look cheap? Will it last? Is it right? Will my husband like it? Will my wife like it? Will my kids break it? Will it fit? This is what you think about when you're shopping. You always have these kind of, these absolutely fundamental variables that you're, you're trying to answer. And obviously, and, and um, quite regularly, photography is the main thing that people grab onto when they're trying to work out whether something's right or wrong for them. You'll know straight away. You'll quickly move on if it's not. So amazing to think of the amount of thinking that's gone into that one image. And then amazing to think about how little we think about it um, during the design process. Seems weird, doesn't it? Seems odd. And so fundamentally, I've been thinking about this. And then the very next day, I'd be putting together a prototype or a wireframe or whatever I was doing. And then thinking, oh, I think this, this page could do with a photo. Chuck a photo in there. Get my little placeholder out. Jobs are good and pop that in there. <laughs> Designer can worry about that, whatever it might be. And so, you know, I was doing it. And what a hypocrite. You know, it's me blurring on about photos. And, and I'm, I'm doing this as well. And so, but it's standard fare. I mean, have any of you guys used one of these little friends in the past? You know, it's, but it's fair enough, isn't it? You know, I, I can't even think about photos. You know, I've got enough on my plate. So weird. I, you know, always struck me as strange. Um, so the more I thought about it, the more I started to see it, as is often the case, of course, these, these stories started to come out from within my research. This is actually the, the project that, that where the light bulb went off in my head about thinking, actually, this is a thing. So um, this is for a client uh, of mine who I worked with a couple of years ago called Wiltshire Farm Foods. They, 
they um, sell frozen ready meals to people. So they'll um, deliver them to your door, complete meals. Their average customer age is about 82, 83. Typical, uh, typical customer is widowed, living on their own. Um, not so much can't cook, probably has problems creating a, a meal, probably can't be bothered, you know, it's a big effort to do it. Um, so gets food delivered. So you'll go onto the website, and the research we did was with the sons and daughters of the people who ended up as the end consumers of these products. So imagine, imagine you're doing your shopping for your elderly parent, maybe your, your mum who's living on her own, age 82. You're, you're kind of ordering her food for the week or the month for them. The situation you've got to think about is that a stranger is going to go to your mum's house, and your mum's 82, so she's got to open the door. A stranger's got all this food. Your 82-year-old mother can't take the food and put it in the fridge, so a stranger's going to go in your mum's house put the food in the fridge, how does that make you feel? Well, what a nightmare, you know, what a horrible situation. It's a really, really scary thing. So on the face of it, this project felt like it was about ordering food, but actually when we started talking to people who were using the service, it was about, I want to check my mum's going to be okay, which is, crikey, I didn't, I didn't see that coming at all, and of course you don't. And it, this is often the way in research projects, isn't it? The things that you perceive are going to be the interesting things about a project aren't the things that actually get you. Things like this come up and you think, oh, this is interesting. So we were testing this stuff, and, and this, this thing up here was like a carousel on the homepage. And uh, I think we must have been testing this in the winter, and we'd had a really, really hard winter. And so um, the image of the, the person delivering the van in the snow was uh, really, really resonated with people. And people saw this site for the first time. They never heard about the brand. They didn't know anything about the service. And they said, oh, this looks amazing, because they're going to deliver to my mum whatever the weather. I was just like, bloody hell, that's incredible. And they were advocates straight away, and they just perceived that from this one image. And that may or may not have been true, I don't know, but you know, what a powerful thing. And you know, it was a first impression. How could you ever convey that in text? How would you ever help, hope to get that across to someone? Very, very difficult. Um, and again, the more I looked, the more I found. This is a, a bit of work we did for, for Love Film. And uh, we were looking at different propositions and how you package things and bundle things and all those kind of things. And so. They had these different bundles. You can go for the, anyone a Love Film customer or a Netflix customer? You know, you can buy the, oh, I'll have, you know, for a fiver, I'll have three DVDs a month, or I'll have a, a DVDs and a game for £8.50, whatever it might be. Clearly, some bundles are more commercially advantageous than others, and often, you know, they'll want to steer people towards a certain direction. And I think the one that was a good one for them was this one with the film lover, this chap in the middle. Within the research, this man became known as Liam Gallagher Man, which I thought was brilliantly resonant for being in Manchester. People didn't like him. He looks a bit nasty, you know, which is a nightmare. So straight away, people thought, looked at him and said, oh, I'm not like him. He looks a bit horrible. Um, I'll, go, I'll go for the 399. And they were tearing their hair out, thinking, oh, God, it's a nightmare. We want, we want to get people on that. So straight away, when we see images of people, then you're in a whole new world of psychology around how you, how you respond to that. This made me smile the other day. Uh, every time I log into analytics, I think this is their standard image, I'm frightened by this dead eye stare. <laughs> and it's, it's a bit cruel, I mean, it's not a great, great image, but you know, that's, that's people's first reaction to this, and we can't help but do it. You know, it's fight or flight, you know, we, we absolutely can't, can't avoid it. So you have to be careful when you're using pictures of people, particularly in situations like this. Um, this was some stuff we, we did, and um, the proposition here, join the UK's most trusted healthcare. Hard to trust people when you can't look them in the eyes. <laughs> and this came out in the research. I mean, looking at this, it's quite an innocent thing. You just think, you know, it's just a bloke mucking about on the beach with his kids and stuff. But, but actually, they, people really started to question whether they could trust this, this brand. And just think how, imagine like had you spent tens of thousands of pounds developing this kind of proposition. And then an image like this totally throws it. Massive, isn't it? And then thinking back to my role within that process and thinking, oh, I'd like to have thought that I'd thought everything through. I've worked out all the user journeys and thought about who's coming and satisfied the user needs and got everything absolutely nailed. And it's completely, you know, it's gone in an instant because the image is wrong. Um, I've got lots of examples of more qualitative research because that's what I do, really. Um, and I, I sought to find a bit more um, quant stuff. Uh, and this is a guy you need to be looking for. Some of you may already follow Craig on, on Twitter. He's, he's a brilliant guy. Um, he does lots around uh, conversion rate optimization. And he's got some great stories to tell. Um, if you look him up on SlideShare, he he, he's great because he just shares all his stuff. And there's a good interview he did up on the web psychologist, up on the link up there. And I'm sure we'll share the slides, so don't worry scrabbling it down. Um, and he's, he talks about. Um, he talks about when he used to work for a company called Belron, who were autoglass, you know, the people who replace car windscreens and things. 
So they were trying to sell what he calls a distress purchase. I mean, yeah, who likes having their windscreen smashed? What a nightmare. Um, and then they did loads and loads of research around the best imagery to use to try and sell that product and saw some really interesting data, both from a, from a quant point of view and how, how conversion changed based on all sorts of variables, whether matching the, the models in the, on the website compared to the advertising, men, women, what they were wearing, what their body language was doing, um, and found some really fascinating things. And I, I just pulled out a few quotes that I thought were, were, were particularly kind of, that resonated with me, but particularly this idea of comprehension of a product or service is hugely down to photos. And it can be very, very hard to articulate you know, a value proposition for want of a better horrible piece of jargon. And often a, and a photo is a very, very effective way of doing that. Um, and also this idea about how photography is matching the emotional state, which is a great point thinking back to the one about the lady who just had her identity stolen. I mean, when have you ever seen anyone that relaxed who's just had that happen to them? You know, it doesn't happen. So look Craig up. He's a great guy. So what the hell is a usable photo? What am I blurring on about? Um, I, I kind of had a, had a crack at trying to define what this thing might be, and I got this far, so I think um, the most usable and effective photos communicate something clearly to the user, are useful, or in keeping with the brand, they evoke a, an emotional response and influence the user in the way that the designer intended. So maybe not as snappy as I imagined, but uh, I've had a crack there. In terms of the different types of photos you'll typically see, I think they can be broadly classified into two types. You've got ornamental photos. Here's where the stock, the, the stock comes in. You know, what other choice, what other picture would you use to try and convey obligation? Some wires, you know, amazing. So, filler, it doesn't really do a job. This is what I call a content photo, it's useful. I can see it in use, I get a sense of how big it is. I can see where it sits on the, on the, on the kind of pannier rack on the bike. I get an idea of capacity, what I can sneak in, it's useful. It's good, isn't it? You know, it's fantastic. It does a job, it sells the product, but it's kind of useful as well. And I'll just show a few more examples, really. I think effective photos show the benefit of a product. You know, this is a, sorry, another camera example. I'm a bit obsessed. But, you know, straight away, oh, I get the use of that, because actually it's a pain taking a big tripod like the one down there on holiday. If I can sneak one of these things in my rucksack, I can get a steady shot if I'm doing a long exposure on a railing, on a bar, or something like that. So, great, I get it. And amazing, you know, it can carry the weight of an SLR. That's a cool thing. So, you know, I haven't read any of the, I don't, I don't know what the brand is. I haven't read any of the kind of sales stuff, but I get it. Often the style of photography is the product. You know, with lifestyle brands like, say, Howie's, which I think this is from, you recognize the brand through the style of imagery, which is amazing, really. You know, they've got such a tight design style. Um, you can spot it a mile off, and I'm sure there's lots of other brands that you would be able to, you'd be able to pick just from the style of photography. Um, earlier I was talking about use of the eyes and using them to your advantage, and we can't help but, you know, if there's someone on the street doing that, you can't help but look over there, see what the hell's going on, and that's just, that's just how we're wired. And interesting to see how some of these design examples have, have done exactly that, you know, Nike and Adidas, uh, sorry, Puma, using to um, point towards calls to action or key messages and those sorts of things. But also I saw this, I did some research for these guys, Archive in Bristol, and even animals work. You can use an animal. And, you know, it was diverting people's attention across, and, Fascinating, you know, fascinating to see how that works. But obviously, if you've got people looking the other way, then it's a, you know, has a big impact. But if you're just chucking the cross on the, you know, the placeholder in, then how do you know? Um, I mentioned a bit about style guides and things, and people like John Lewis spend a huge amount of money making sure their photography is absolutely consistent. So when you're browsing, whatever they are, cardigans or something, um, you're not swayed by the difference in the way they're shot. You're just looking at the product, and that's obviously hugely important. You compare that with something like eBay, which of course would have a huge issue trying to standardize photography, and I'm sure they've tried to teach people, but you know, that's the nature of the beast, they're gonna look inconsistent. Um, and look at the tellies. You know, some people are taking pictures with the telly on, some people telly off, some people the telly sideways. You know, that's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> that's gonna happen. But think about you know the impact it has. Photography is also really useful when you're trying to convey intangibles. Um, I pitched years ago to Bentley, didn't win it actually. Um, but it was really interesting to think, how on earth do you sell a product that's so expensive? And what's the role of the website? Because, you know, somebody's going to spend, what, I don't know, £200,000 on a car. Are they really going to go online and start doing a bit of research? Probably not, really. Um, but they had a lot of stories they wanted to tell about quality and craftsmanship. And so straight away, another company that does really well at Buffalo, the clothing manufacturer, outdoor clothing, you know, it, it's all about showing um, the big selling points are around the UK and uh, quality and kind of tailor-made, that kind of thing. So hugely powerful. Um, 
effective photos give credibility. Again, this is, this is Archive, a, a charity I've done some work with in Bristol, and their patron is Sir David Attenborough. So if you're a natural history-based brand and you've got Sir David Attenborough on board, you're going to bring him on. I mean, you're going to bring it to, you know, you're going to, you're going to plaster that all over your site, aren't you? And that's what they did. Hugely beneficial, although, so when we tested this with, with people of a certain age, maybe kind of um, 20s and older, everyone was saying, oh, this is David Asper, amazing, yeah, fantastic. We tested it with kids because it had loads of teaching resources, and they looked at that picture and said, oh, yeah, this website's for old people. <laughs> Which I was just like, you can't say that about to David Asper. That's, that's outrageous, but fair enough, you know, fair enough. Other qualities of good photos that they convey scale. You know, often it's very, very hard to appreciate how big or small something is. And if you're, I don't know, for example, buying something for your house and you've got a certain space you need to fit something in, you've got to make sure it fits because it's a pain in the ass sending stuff back, being blunt, isn't it, really? So, you know, they're doing a, get, a great job to convey the size of something within the context of where it's used. You know, if you're going to buy a transit van and you want to shift pallets around, you've got to know it fits. Um, some interesting things around persuasion here. I mean, not all... I'm sure you've all got these from LinkedIn going back to that about how, you know, ooh, I'm suddenly more interested about what that person's now because I can see their face and I remember them and that kind of resonates with you. But also around the charity sector and how they use different imagery to, to kind of encourage you to essentially spend more money. And that's not just in the charity sector, of course. That's a slightly callous example, um, but clearly very, very important. So how do you evaluate photo UX? It's a, it's a tricky thing. So um, I think what's important is to appreciate that Photography is all about communication. And uh, I've taken this quote here from, from Don, Mo Don, Don Norman and tweaked it slightly um, because it works brilliantly for photography as well. It's about communication. As to whether what you intend someone to perceive from your photography is what they actually perceive is what it's all about. You know, you may have a hypothesis that if you use this image over this image, you may get a certain response. And then really the only way of finding out is within, within your research to understand. And it's like anything, you, you see the most amazing things that people perceive from imagery that you'd never, never anticipate. Um, I did a bit of research to try and understand a bit more about kind of what it is, what makes a compelling, persuading argument. And it turns out that Aristotle had all this photo UX stuff absolutely nailed, which I read about in this book up on the, on the top left there, which I'd wholeheartedly recommend for a, a good quick read into the murky world of content strategy, which is confusing, I find. Um, so I tried to, and, and that talked about breaking these things down into, you know, a, a successful communication will have both credibility, will evoke some kind of emotion, and, and also kind of resonate from a logical perspective as well. Um, and I've broken this down a bit further and running short of time, so I won't go into too much detail. But, you know, when we're considering a purchase, we may think about all those different aspects. You know, the kind of rational mind will think, oh, do I need it? Oh, I've got loads of those, do I need it? The kind of, um, from a, an emotional appeal, like, oh, I just want it. I want it, I don't care, I want that thing. Um, from a reputational point of view, you may be thinking, well, do I trust the brand? Is it something that's gonna last? Is it gonna be a good quality? Um, I had a crack at trying to work out some heuristics that you could use within your evaluation. So uh, much as, you know, I know it's often the case you can't get a chance to do some user research, it's useful to have those kind of checklists to say, is this good, is this good or bad? Um, I published some here, they're on the Photo UX Code UK blog as well. So, do have a crack at using them. I'd love to know how you, fi how you find them. I'd love to kind of iterate and improve them as well. So do look those up. So practical things. What do I believe you can do today? Well, maybe tomorrow now, let's be fair. Um, to improve photo UX. Um, I've been reading a lot about content strategy recently, and I thought it'd be interesting to think about photography. Content strategy seems the most vague term ever. Content. What? It's everything. OK, so, you know, absolutely everything. So I was thinking, OK, one, one example of content is, is photos. Let's think about that. Strategy, another brilliantly broad word. So perceive this as coming up with a plan for your photos. Evaluating what you've got, deciding what you need, getting what you need, evaluating the impact. So I broke it down on those kind of levels, and I, I put a, um, just put my thoughts down on the slide share. So do take a look through there, and hopefully that will give you a sense of where that's going. I've also encountered a few... Clients who've come to me since publishing this stuff and saying, yeah, we, we're thinking of taking a more strategic approach to our photography. Um, how do we do it and how can that work? And I think there's, there's definitely mileage in that approach. And I've outlined a, a kind of, I guess, a roadmap you could follow within that presentation. The other thing is around, um, so annotating wireframes. So fair enough, you can put a, a placeholder in, that's absolutely fine. But it, it would be a bit of a tragedy if you didn't communicate the intention of that image to whoever's going to pick up this work from you further down the line. So you may have seen a certain insight within your research, um, and you may have something that you just need to convey to someone. So 
I don't care which image you choose, but can you just make sure it tries to do this or it conveys this need or does this thing? And at least you're then doing something. Um, much as people maybe don't ever read annotations, I don't know, but at, le at least it gives a chance of these things being passed down. Um, the other interesting thing is I was doing some pictures for um, Richard Caddick and Steve Cable's book, my boss and my, my mate uh, Steve at work. And um, it was a really nice process because naturally we fell into this process of like, I need an image that's going to do this sort of job. And they said, like, okay, yeah, can you just sketch it out for me? So they sketched out a photo. And then I had a brief to for taking the image. And it's a really nice way of working from a, I guess one from a visualizing a very kind of potentially complicated thing. And it's the way we work, isn't it? You know, we sketch down ideas very, very quickly. So a nice little, nice little hint. So that was the idea, that was the image, brilliant. Um, photo style guides are something that I, I only ever see style guides in sort of brand guidelines. So there'll be some like, the, the photos you need to use are kind of, the, oh, I saw a brilliant one recently. It's like, they need, red needs to be a dominant color in, the, in our photography. I'm just like, what? You know, how does that help me choose? And you know, the, the photos are so much more important. So contributing to photography style guides from UX point of view is I think something that we could be doing. You know, we could be saying, the anxiety of the customer is this, we need to uh, allay that anxiety by using photography that does these things and showing examples. Photo audits, you know, content audits are a standard kind of process, I think. Why not do an audit if you're photography? Go through um, and try and answer some of these kind of points. Get a sense for what you have, what you can reuse, what you, need to, what you need to kind of reshoot and throw away. It's a standard technique, and we can tweak it for the purposes of what, what we want. Working out what you need as well. And I'm sure some of you guys use this kind of task modeling approach or mental modeling where you're decomposing a journey from beginning to end and you're mapping down user anxieties and business requirements and priorities at different points of that journey. You can use this to kind of generate ideas for the sorts of imagery that may allay some of those anxieties and meet some of those user needs. So it's a quick and easy way of creating um, a, you know, a shot list, really. Does this look familiar to everyone? We talked a bit about personas today can be a bit of a dirty word sometimes, but um, you know, the classic situation where a persona document is all about trying to convey, um, cr creating a hypoth hypothetical person to try and let a third party or someone else empathize with that individual. There's no worse way to do that than to use someone who doesn't really exist, a fake person. Why would you do that? I was thinking about this and I was working on a persona project and we'd brought people in to do some user research into the lab. And I thought, well, if that person's been recruited as a real customer of this service, why don't I just take a picture of them on the way out and then we can use those images, those images within our persona profiles. And we already had them. They, they were being incentivized to do the research. We checked with them it was okay to take a picture. Set up a cheap backdrop thing in the office and on the way out, just said, oh, do you mind, just get a quick picture. And then we used their images for they ended up having these kind of full-size cutouts that they kept in their office. So dead easy, it's really cheap, you know, it doesn't need to be expensive. Um, and the other thing I think is really important is to, to use images to tell stories, which is what, you know, we've, again, this has come up a little bit today around how effective these things could be. And this was a project I worked on with the Environment Agency. It was all about spreading um, awareness around flood risk. So, you know, how do you tell a story around the dangers of flooding? I mean, we've seen it last winter, it was horrific. Um, and people, you know, obviously forget about it, don't think they're going to be affected, but it's a huge problem, absolutely massive problem in this country, and it's only going to get worse. And so what we did was we, um, we got in contact with some people who had been victims of floods, and we interviewed them over the phone because they're all over the country, and then we put together a very cheap kind of slideshow which had their own photos that they'd sent to us of, their, of sewage up their walls in their, in their dining rooms, of their kids' toys covered in sewage in the garden, of like just the houses destroyed. And then we put the audio of them talking to us on the, in the background and packaged together a little deliverable, which was just essentially a slideshow with audio and pictures, gave them to the client, and it was amazingly powerful, hugely powerful. And it wasn't a necessarily a complicated thing to organize, um, but, you know, fantastically powerful. Um, so this sometimes, it seems like it's a bit controversial, this, but something we've been doing for a while is actually putting, you know, representative images in prototypes. Like, why not? Why not? Dead easy to do, cheap, quick, dirty, whatever. Um, and amazing the kind of feedback you can get from such a simple thing about how things are perceived and understood. So I definitely recommend doing this because you'll learn something and it's much more constructive than just chucking in the old <laughs> So there you go, that's me. I think I'm at time. So um, all I'd say is please give us a bit more consideration and think about it on your next project and hopefully we can kind of try and make things a bit better. So thank you.